We are in the midst of a sermon series right now in the book of Acts, which I am really excited about because Acts is the story of this first church being planted in the city of Jerusalem. And we're just watching this church plant just explode from the 120 people meeting together in the upper room to 3,000 to 5,000 to 5,000, to these great multitudes of people that are coming to faith throughout the city. And, and it is exciting to watch this church grow, but the last couple of weeks we've been seeing um, conflicts start to emerge, first from the religious establishment, and as we're going forward, we're starting to see some opposition now from the common man. So, so we're going to be jumping into a text this week, it's Acts chapter 6 and 7 we're going to be in, and it's on Stephen's um, speech before the Sanhedrin. So if you don't have a Bible, um, just slip your hand up here. We'll, we'll get one of those um, into your hands there in the back so you can read right alongside um, with us. Um, we are in, um, again, Acts chapter 6, uh, starting in verse 8. is a page number for that. It's page uh, 594 and uh, 595. So if you are wanting to follow along in one of those little paperbacks, um, encourage you to do that. But um, as, we're, as we're getting into this text here, I want to warn you up front, this, this text gets a little intense. This is more, more uh, West Philly than West Michigan. There's, there's debate, there's, there's challenge, there's confrontation, there's violence. Like, this text is intense. And so if this text offends you a little bit because of our kind of comfortable, warm, cozy little West Michigan culture, I'm just going to warn you in advance here, Stephen is going to be going after it. Uh, pretty intensely. So, so be warned, get ready. The tone of this text is, is definitely pretty intense. The honeymoon period is over for the church here in the book of Acts, and it's, and it's into kind of the real world struggle of what's going on. So, so I'm going to read that, and we're going to pray, and we will get right underway. So, so here we are, Acts chapter 6, starting out here in verse 8. I'm just going to read the first uh, 15 verses, and then I'm going to pick up the rest of the text as we're moving through. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freemen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of Go to the Lord in prayer as we get underway this morning. Father, we long to be a fearless church like Stephen, out on the front lines defending your gospel in a, in a hostile environment. Father, full of your grace, full of your power, full of your Holy Spirit and wisdom. And, and God, we, we confess that that's not always us, Father. We, we sang earlier today, prone to wander, Lord, we feel it. And, and God, we, we struggle, God, to be the fearless church that you're calling us to be. And so we pray that you would come by the power of your Holy Spirit this morning and that you would make us a church, God, fearless for your gospel, a church that, that is full of your presence and your power and your grace. And so I pray that you would help me this morning to serve your people well. All in Jesus' name. Amen. So my aim for uh, this morning as we dive into this text is to make us a church that fearlessly shares the gospel by the power of the Holy Spirit in this religious culture. If you are following along, if you're taking notes, um, three points for you. The first is Stephen fearlessly shares the gospel. He gets put on trial. So Stephen is going to fearlessly share this gospel with the people put on trial. Stephen fearlessly calls the people to repentance as he's put on trial. And then finally, Stephen fearlessly faces death. And so the title for the sermon is A Fearless Church, because I hope as we grow into this New Testament church, this 
book of Acts that we would begin to look like this early church and that would be a church that looks like this young and fearless uh, guy, Stephen. So, so let's jump right in here and look at, at Stephen in action here. He's about to be put on trial here in verses 8 through 15. And I want to introduce Stephen to you first of all. Stephen is, he's one of the young guns in the church, okay? We just got introduced to him last week. He got promoted kind of as one of the early deacons of the church. And they had full of the Holy Spirit, they had full of power. They said, Let, let's put this guy in charge of serving the widows in the community and taking care of some of the needs. But we see that he's not just going to be a deacon. He's not just going to wait on tables. This guy is a and he's a fireball, okay? We read that Stephen, first of all, right out of here in verse 8, he is full of grace and power. And what we're going to see here is that Stephen is going to step in some of the same roles that we've seen the apostles in throughout the text here earlier. You know, the apostles have been on the scene, they've been doing miracles, they've been preaching, and, you know, powerful responses have come, come from that. So we're going to see the same thing from Stephen Again, this morning, I want to draw your attention here to verse 8, because this is, this is so vital that we see this. Like, this is not just a charismatic guy. This is not just somebody who's got the kind of personality that steps out there on the stage. But I want you to notice right from the bat here in verse 8 is that Stephen is full of grace and power. This is, this is something that God is doing in this man's heart through the power of the Holy Spirit and fulfillment of what God said all the way back in Acts 1.8. Do you remember? He said, we will, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost end of the earth. And so this man, Stephen, full of God's power, full of God's spirit, is going to step out with God's message into the midst of a pretty intense situation. So we see him, like the apostles here, in verse 8. He's going to be doing great signs and wonders among the people. So he's going to be preaching and teaching about Jesus, but he's also going to be performing signs and wonders that are authenticating this message that's going forward. And so just like the apostles, he's going to follow in their footsteps. And so if you are one of those young men or women in the church, right? I want you to see that this isn't just the apostles. This isn't just the 12 that are out there on the streets. There is a, there's a young generation rising up in this early church, and we're going to see one of their finest this morning in action, and it is a, it's a powerful story. And so Stephen is going to find opposition, actually, from an unlikely party. We read here in verse 9, then some of those who belong to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, the Cyrenians and the Alexandrians and those from Cilicia and Asia, they rose up and disputed with Stephen. And so we learned last week that Stephen is, he's a Hebraic Jew, right? He has a Greek background. He moved to Jerusalem from out of town. He's got the Hebrew cult or Greek culture, Greek background, but he's a Jew, so he's zealous for the law of God, but, but he's also got this background. He's coming from a little bit of a different culture than the Jews in Jerusalem, and where he's finding opposition actually is from his own people, his own tribe, these Hellenistic Jews, also, you know, Jews that have moved back to Jerusalem, who are equally zealous about the traditions that they've been handed down, and so, so they're going to butt heads here pretty intensely um, going forward. Uh, it's worth noting here that these men who are going to oppose him, they're part of a uh, synagogue of the freedmen. And so a synagogue in those days, you think, well, why do they have a synagogue, right? They're in Jerusalem. They've got the temple where the sacrifices are offered, where prayers are offered up to God every day. Well, why would you have a synagogue in Jerusalem? And for those who aren't familiar with some of the distinctions there, a synagogue was basically committed to preaching, teaching the word. It was more similar to what we have today in our modern church environment in the temple where, where sacrifices were kind of a central offering. The synagogue was a place where people got into the word, they studied, they were instructed, you know, they were getting into it together, discussing it together. And so what I want you to see here is that these guys know their scriptures very well, right? They're in a religious city already, Jerusalem, but Stephen is going to be disputing with some of the guys that really know their scriptures well, that are really passionate about their Old Testament, and they are deeply disturbed by the gospel that Stephen is preaching, and so they challenge him, they get into a dispute with them, 
what we read in verse 10, these amazing words, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. And so Stephen, as we've already noted, full of the Holy Spirit, full of God's power, you know, he is speaking in such a way that they couldn't withstand it. Jesus said back in Luke 21, 15, when you get put on trial, when people arrest you, you know, don't even prepare a statement because I'm going to give you the words to say, I'm going to give you a supernatural wisdom so that you can step out there and be a bold and fearless witness to my gospel. And that's what's happening right here with Stephen. Stephen is full of the spirit that these religious leaders, these scholars, these church people, they can't withstand that this religious culture is not going to be able to stand against. And so, so when the debate breaks down, when they realize they're not going to be able to convince this guy uh, through their training and through their knowledge and through their study, they resort to a little bit of a smear campaign in verse 11. Then they secretly instigated men who said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes. And they came upon him, seized him, brought him before the council, and he set up false witnesses who said, this man never ceases to speak against the holy place and the law, for we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. It's, it's remarkable. As we look at this text, they're going to falsely accuse him, right, with blaspheming Moses and God. You really couldn't, if you were a Jew, like, you couldn't come up with a much more serious critique, like blaspheming God, blaspheming Moses, kind of the founding father, you know, blaspheming the temple, like the center of the Jewish religion. Like, they are going after this guy with everything they got. They are throwing every charge that they could possibly level to bury this guy, which is their intent, as we're going to see. Uh, but Luke wants to let us know here in the book of Acts, right, that, that these are false witnesses in verse 13. This is all a bunch of, of nonsense here to smear the reputation of um, Stephen here in this text. And, and I love the contrast that, that Luke is going to set for us here, right, between these weighty charges, right, blaspheming God, the Holy Spirit, the temple, the law, everything sacred in Judaism, they're claiming that this man has stood against. And yet, Stephen, standing in their midst, is going to have a face that is shining like an angel. I mean, it's a remarkable contrast between what the religious leaders, the authorities here, as he's been dragged off here to the synagogue, and he's, he's again standing before this great audience, and, and everyone around him can see his face shining like an angel. It, it's God's presence, and that's God's power with this man, even though everyone is standing against him. In this situation, before we get to the showdown, really, in the trial, because Stephen is going to give it right back to them, I just want to reflect really briefly just on Stephen's fearlessness and, and really the culture's response. Because um, it's interesting, as we look at this text here, I just think too easily we look at that and go, okay, that was then, this is now, okay? That was the book of Acts. Amazing, incredible things are happening. Jesus is alive. Jesus is on the move. These people are filled with the Holy Spirit. They're moving out. And then we look at our own lives and we just go, eh, you know, not really feeling that fearless this morning, you know, not really feeling that level of, of courage and movement. What I want to I just want to remind you this morning is this this is not Stephen, you know, some kind of this is not just his charisma, this is not his power, this is not his personality. This is God at work, and this is the same God building his church today. This is the same spirit filling him with power. This is the same God working mightily in their midst that we have today. And, and if we forget that, if we think that through our own skills and our charm and you know, our SWOT analysis and our leadership vision and somehow by our own ability and our own power, we're going to be able to turn the city upside down here, we're, we're not going to get anywhere, okay? This is, this is something so vital to our church that we see the fearlessness that Stephen is filled with in this text. And it, it's coming from God, and that same God is moving actively in our midst, in our lives, in our church, and in our city. And we get to partner with this very God in the midst of the city that God has called us to be. But what I think is really instructive here in this text is despite being filled with the Spirit, despite being fearless, despite having everything going for him, God is clearly with him, on his side. He's in opposition. 
He's in struggle. This is not easy for Stephen. Right? The culture in which he lived did not, with open arms, receive this gospel. Right? We're in a city right now, Grand Rapids, really religious city, I always love to call it, Jerusalem. Right? We're in the middle of this kind of holy city where there's churches on every corner and everybody knows the gospel. And so, you know, or has thought they know the gospel and has kind of rejected it. And so we're, we're in an area where, you know, we share the gospel, no one wants to hear it. They're like, oh, been there, tried that, done that, didn't work. I'm on to some other alternative form of spirituality. We're trying something new. That, that whole gospel thing, that church thing, my parents tried that, maybe they've tried that, and, and it just didn't work for them. It's interesting as we enter this culture, I, I love what N.T. Wright says. He said, pretty famously, he said, wherever St. Paul went, there was a riot. Wherever I go, they serve tea. You know, it's, it's kind, of, kind of like, you know, Stephen stepping on the scene, it's like a mob trial, everything's going crazy, and, and you know, we step into our culture here, and it's just kind of like, eh, whatever, the gospel, who cares, not that interesting. And, and so I think we are up against kind of a unique challenge as we think about what it looks like to fearlessly preach the gospel in this culture. There's just a lot of apathy. There's just a lot of people that are just burned out on the church. There's a lot of frustration against religion. And what I want to suggest to you this morning is that as we move forward into this city and as we make an impact here, we're going to experience some of the same kind of opposition Peter experienced. We're going to experience opposition both from the irreligious and the religious because the gospel challenges both. It's so vital and so important to see in this text here that as Stephen is challenging the culture with the gospel, it's not the irreligious people, it's not the pagans that have a problem with what he's saying. Who is it that's going after him? It's the religious establishment, right? It's the people that think they know the word. It's the people that are church people. They're the ones that have a problem. Because when you're confronted with the gospel, church people just want to say, hey, I'm a good person, you know? I should go to heaven. God should, God should let me in. You know, I've been a good guy. I'm a good West Michigan person. I'm a good family man. I work at my job. I'm like one of those people out there that, you know, does whatever. And then we've got the sense of religious entitlement, right? So we're working in a city that's full of people that, that are good people and they're religious people and they really don't need Jesus. They don't need the offense of the cross. They don't need any of those things. And, and Stephen's gospel challenges that religious culture with that, with that Jesus as the offense. We're also going to experience some opposition from the irreligious culture, right? We've got a lot of young hipsters in the community that are experimenting with all kinds of alternative lifestyles and alternative spiritualities and lots of stuff like that. When they hear all this about the miraculous, the supernatural, they go, this is just a bunch of nonsense. You know, have you guys, like, totally turned your brains off? Like, you know, you know, what are you guys thinking? Like, believing all this silly superstition, these old wives' tales. And so the gospel comes in and says, at the center of our faith is the resurrection of Jesus, this supernatural event. And since Jesus is alive and he's risen, he's at the right hand of God, he's moving in our lives and our city. And so the gospel kind of comes against both this religious and irreligious section. As we step into this culture, we need to just expect that we are going to come up against some of the same opposition that Stephen came against. So, so how is Stephen going to respond to the religious establishment in his city? Right? These guys that are furious that he's teaching Jesus, they've just grabbed him, they've just dragged him off to the Sanhedrin, which is the religious tribunal, the religious court of affairs, and they're officially going to put him on trial for what he is teaching and preaching about Jesus. He's got a couple options here, doesn't he? You know, if you're Stephen, you know, what would you be thinking? Okay, I've just been dragged off by an angry mob who hate my guts right now, and they're putting me on trial before the religious court, and, you know, I should probably tone things down. Like, I should probably play this safe, right? You know, maybe if I just tell them this is all just a big misunderstanding, you know, I love the law too, you know, probably I love the temple, I'm not disrespecting the temple. I love God, come on, we Christians love God too. Can't we all just get along? That'd be a very West Michigan response, wouldn't it? It'd be a very Grand Rapids, let's just all get along and sing Kumbaya, and it'll be a great kind of, you know, let's have a great time together, all celebrating our religious diversity, and, and you know, I, I kind of be tempted to do that, I don't know if you would, right? It's just, it's just big peace, maybe this isn't a good idea, but what Stephen is going to do is, is remarkable, right? He is going to get right up in their faces, and Stephen is going to fearlessly call the religious leaders of his day to repent. He's, he's going to jump right into their faces, and he's going to tell them, look, 
you guys have entirely missed the entire point of your scriptures. You entirely missed the entire point of the temple. You missed the entire point of the law. And you are not, I'm not the one blaspheming God. You're the ones that have totally missed what God is doing in the scriptures and in the world. And so Stephen is going to step into an extensive sermon here in verses 2 um, through 50 of chapter 7. And I can't go through this all in detail, so I'm going to kind of give you the blow by blow. I'm going to sum it up here as he steps in here and delivers a very elaborate response to their charges. If you remember, he's been charged with a couple of different things. The first charge, right, which I'm going to address, he's been charged with is speaking against the temple, right, which is right there in Jerusalem, is imposing emphasis, it's kind of the center of Jewish life. It's where the blood sacrifices are offered for their sins. It's where prayers are offered. Jews from all over the world come to the temple, and they say, this man's been speaking against the temple, and not only this man, but Jesus, right, his teacher, you know, also was saying he's going to destroy the temple. And so, you know, Stephen has got to respond to this charge. And you know, what he does, rather than just correcting their misunderstanding of Jesus' teaching. Jesus said he was going to destroy the temple. He said, if you destroy this temple, which is actually my body, then I'm going to raise it up again in three days and come back to life. And so instead of correcting that, Stephen actually does something entirely different. He just goes off on this long discourse here of how God is way bigger than the temple. God is way bigger than a building. And so if you follow the flow of chapter 7, he's going to say, look, look at Abraham, right? Our father, you know, the patriarch kind of of our entire nation. You know, God revealed his glory to him while he was in the pagan land of Mesopotamia. There were no temples, no tabernacles. There was even a nation of Israel. And God showed up and his glory met him right there. He says it right there, two brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was in Mesopotamia, while he was in this pagan land. God showed up. God met him. He got the glory of God. The glory of God isn't contained to this little temple, this little house that you built. And then he goes on and he talks about Joseph, how, how our fathers, right, the, the patriarchs of the race, right, turned on Joseph and sold him into slavery, sent him to the land of Egypt, right? And so God met Joseph in Egypt, in this, in this pagan country. And throughout the scripture, is going to be a nation that's the enemy of God. You know, God is going to show up, meet him, bless him, answer his dreams, bring him to a state of prominence, leaves him to be a ruler in the land of Egypt, you know, provide for Israel's welfare. And uh, Stephen goes on through that story. And then he goes on to Moses, right? He was born in Egypt. And, you know, you know if you know the story, he's... You know, he's born into this slavery, and, and the children are being executed, and God raises him up to be a leader and a deliverer for his people, and, and Moses is going to, again, meet with God. Not in the land of Israel, but in the land of Midian, where God's going to meet him in a burning bush, and God's going to say, you know, take off your sandals, the, the ground you're standing on is holy, right? It's not just the temple that's a holy place, it's wherever God is that's holy. And he goes on to talk about David, how God's presence went with the people in the tabernacle, and, you know, God went with his people wherever the tabernacle went, and all the way down to King Solomon in verse 45, right, who built a temple for God to live in, and yet even Solomon says this in Kings, 1 Kings 8, 4, 8, 27, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, much less this house that I have built. And Stephen is going to go on to quote Isaiah 66, 1 here in our text here in verse, um, over here in verse find it at some point. Verse 49, where he says, Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What kind of a house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hands make all of these things? And so, basically, right, Stephen's in Gophet Shum, look, God is way bigger than your buildings. God is way bigger than the temple. And God is moving in ways that you aren't fully understanding. And he's going to go on to their charge about speaking against the law. This is like charge number two, and he's going to say, in effect, I totally agree, right, that the law is perfect, right? He calls them in verse uh, 7, verse 38, living oracles from God, like God spoke these words. These are true. These are valuable, you know, but guess what, guys? Did, did any of our ancestors ever live up to the law? Did any of us ever able to accomplish it? And, well, in case you didn't, in case you don't know the answer to that question, he goes through that and documents 
all the cases in which Israel is filled up to live up to God's standard, live up to God's law, to love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and, and love their neighbor. So how are you guys doing at that? You, you're really zealous about this law. You're really zealous about keeping it and following it. How's that working for you? How have you done with that? And he goes on to remind them about Joseph's betrayal and their rebellion against Moses. And, you know, you know, they get the Ten Commandments from God. And immediately, what do they do after they get the Ten Commandments? Stephen's like, guess what? You built a golden calf. You built an idol. The very thing God commanded you to do just, just days before. And there you are partying there. And, and he goes on to go through Amos 5, 25 through 27. And, and the prophetic kind of uh, condemnation of Israel. And, and he's just reminding them over and over again, like the... The law is from God. It's perfect, but we're not. Guys, we're not perfect. And it's an elaborate deal. If you're, if you're lost in all the details here, it's not, at all, it's not at all your fault. This guy is a sharp Jewish scholar who's debating with other Jewish scholars, going through an elaborate history that covers the entire Old Testament, is kind of working this all in and telling them, essentially, look, you missed the point of the law. You missed the point of the temple. And then he answers this third charge of blasphemy, he says, wait a minute, wait a minute here. You're going to claim that I am blaspheming against God, against the temple, against Moses. Like, wait a minute, wait a minute here. He says in verse 51, and this is really kind of the punchline of the sermon as he's working through this grand storyline of the Bible and pretty much showing them in which ways they've, they've gotten it wrong. He says, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced before and the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. So Stephen, I mean, you, you just got to imagine. I mean, this guy is surrounded by a mob who wants to kill him. And he gets up in their face and say, you, you think you represent God? You think you're defending God? You guys have rebelled against God for your entire history. Culminating in your betrayal and execution of your Messiah. This is a mess. This is a disaster. And where he is ending this thing, at least where he's taking it, he doesn't kind of get to land the plane here in this sermon because he kind of gets hijacked midway through. But he's moving towards this call to repentance. Look, he is begging and pleading with his people saying, look, don't miss this. Don't make the same mistake your fathers did. Don't continue to rebel against God and the leaders that he has sent. You know, don't continue down this path because it will destroy you. But right? if you reject Jesus as your Messiah, as the only way, you're standing condemned under the law. Right? And when your temple gets destroyed in 70 AD, the presence of God is going to be gone. If that's where you think God is at, it's not going to be there in 70 or 30 years from that point there. It's going to be gone. You guys are missing the whole scripture. That, that's about as far as he gets in the sermon, because at that point, you know, they are so infuriated that, that, that things are going to happen quickly. But before I get to their response, I, I just want to consider our need to repent. Because, you know, we look at this crowd here that Stephen was preaching to, right? They weren't the pagans, right? They weren't the, those liberal people out there. You know, this wasn't like, you know, the party crowd that he's preaching to. This is the church crowd, right? He's preaching to a group of religious people that think they know their Bible, think they know their God, think they know what's up. And, and he said, look, you guys need to repent. And so as we look into our own hearts, right, we gotta, we got to seriously consider, right, right, do we get this thing? Do we understand this gospel that Stephen is preaching? I want to suggest that the greatest obstacle to becoming a Christian in West Michigan is that so many people think they already are Christians. And they didn't even know what it means to be a Christian. And so, like, yeah, I did that. I, I got baptized or I got said a prayer or, you know, I did, I did something back when I was a kid. Or, you know, I, I go to church you know, on Christmas and Easter. You know, I, I'm probably pretty good, you know. I go to confession every once in a while. Whatever it might be, the greatest op obstacle to Stephen's audience is they think they're already in. The greatest obstacle to our audience is they think they're already in. They're already covenant kids. They're already children of the kingdom. And Stephen is going to blast these guys and say, you guys don't have a clue what you're talking about. And so, so I feel like I wouldn't be doing my job this morning if I didn't bring a challenge to each one of you to say, 
Do you really get this gospel? Do you really understand it? Or is it something that you just grew up with? It's just part of the traditions you've been handed down. It's part of the rituals you've walked through. Or do you really get this gospel? You know, have you confused Christianity with moralism? I still have my, one of my coworkers' words ringing in my ear. You know, he, you know, he, I work in this micro business office with a bunch of other companies and all. And you know, one of the guys in there, he's a Christian guy, he's a financial consultant. He's like, you know, he's talking to the, the pastor guy. Yeah, you know, he's in all that really matters just to be a good person. And, you know, that, that's what it means to be a Christian in West Michigan, right? Just to be a good person and do good things and all that kind of stuff. And I'm just, everything in me is like, no, no, we're not good people. That's the entire point of Stephen's entire sermon. You religious people that think you're good people, you're not good people. And that is what the gospel says to us, the gospel says that we are so jacked up, right, that Jesus had to die on a Roman cross for us, right? We are, we are so screwed up that we need something bigger than just a band-aid, you know? We need something bigger than just showing up to church on a Sunday. We need something bigger than going through some empty, meaningless rituals. We need Jesus' death on the cross for us. We need Jesus' resurrection power. We need Jesus' spirit transforming, renewing, renovating our hearts. And, and if we don't have that, we don't have anything, right? If we're just... We're just playing religious games. If we're just doing morality, trying to be good people, right? We're, we're missing the gospel. And Stephen just wants to come head on at this, at this group of religious people and say, if you don't have Jesus, you're missing it. One of my uh, favorite authors, John Stott, says it so well. He says, Judaism turned the message of God, given through Moses, into the very opposite of what it was. And precisely the same is true of Christians today. Many people have never felt the need of the Lord Jesus Christ. They have never really seen their guilt and their emptiness and their woe. They have never seen the need of the death on the cross on Calvary's hill. Isn't that so tragic, right, that, that we could be in a city that has been inoculated to the gospel to such an extent that, that people don't recognize, right, their need for Jesus, when, they, when they're talking about Christianity and religion, it's just, you know, being a good person, just doing good things, and, and not this recognition, right, that it's got to be God's work within us. It's got to be, it's got to be this Jesus, right? You know, Stephen never gets to the end of his sermon, but, but I think if he would have gone forward, he would have said, guess what? You know, you totally misunderstood the law and only condemned you, but Jesus came to fulfill the law in your place. For your sins, he lived a perfect, right life, and he gives you his righteousness as a gift to you. Right? Jesus came to be the temple, right? His body would be the place right now where people are reconnected with God, right? God doesn't dwell in buildings. Right? God sent his son to come into our world to be the temple, to be the place where we connect with God. Right? And God has sent His Holy Spirit so that He can dwell in us through His Holy Spirit. So now we're the temple, right? Jesus ascended, poured out His Spirit, and now people want to connect with God. Where do they go? They go to us because we have got this gospel message that we share together. The same God who met Abraham, Joseph, Moses, David, Solomon, that same God has revealed Himself definitively in the person of Jesus Christ. And through his Holy Spirit working in our lives. And, and that's the message that we need to hear. That's the message we need to be preaching to ourselves every day. Who is God? What has he done? What has he promised to be for us? You know, those are the kind of things that our culture needs to hear, that God is the defining factor of what makes this church what it is. Right? Our gifts, our abilities, and talents are all something that God is using through his spirit to move out into this city. And if, and if we don't have this gospel at the center of all we do, if we don't have this as the engine driving us forward, we're going to be like Stephen's audience, totally missing who God is, what he's doing in the world and in the city. And so how does, how does Stephen's sermon end? You, know, you think happy ending. Right? We've had a lot of happy endings in Acts so far. Right? The apostles preach, and 3,000 people come to faith. The apostles preach, and five months now, 5,000 people come to faith. The apostles preach and do miracles, and multitudes of people are coming to faith. And so it should all really end happily, right? God's people should just receive his word, and thousands more should be added to the church. That, that's how it would be nice, right, if that's kind of how it went down. That, that's not quite what happens. 
in case you haven't um, read through the end of the story. Let me read it for you. Now, when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said it, he fell asleep. Stephen is going to fearlessly face his own death because he recognizes that God is with him, that God is for him, that God is moving through him. It's amazing when we, when we consider the context here of an angry mob that's decided they're going to drag him out of the city and lynch him, that this man is going to be a guy who moments before is going to stare up into heaven and say, I'm just seeing the glory of God. I, I see Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father. And, and as, he's, as he's just basking in the glory of God and his beauty and his power and what God's doing, he, he's going to be looking through past the curtain of kind of what looks like the reality around him, the Sanhedrin, you know, all condemning him together. And he sees the real court, the final court of appeals in heaven. And he sees Jesus declaring the verdict of well done, good and faithful servant. And, and he gets to step in to this tragic situation with the most remarkable grace you've ever seen, right? I mean, the people, when they, they hear that Jesus is the right hand of God, they just freak out. They're like, that is blasphemy. Jesus, you know, might have been a prophet, whatever. But, but to put him at the right hand of God, I mean, we, we are just way out of line here. They drag him out of the city, stone him to death. And as this man, full of Holy Spirit, full of God's presence, full of God's power, he's just, he's just following Jesus, right? And saying, you know, Father, don't hold this stuff against them. Father, would you... Can I just commit my hands into your spirit as I'm getting stoned to death? You know, and, and as he dies, it's like, it's like we just see this remarkable trajectory of God's grace and God's power and God's presence at work in the life of this man. Uh, I, just, I just love looking through the narrative and just seeing God's presence and Jesus' power all over it. Isn't it beautiful from every point in this narrative, from Stephen's, from that first verse we read, of Stephen being full of grace and power, to the wisdom and spirit with which he was speaking to the people, to his face shining, the face of an angel, to this vision of the glory of God and Jesus standing, God's right hand. This is a man who knew his God well, who knew his gospel well, who experienced his power and his presence and was stepping fearlessly out into the situation God had placed him in. And I just have to ask you this morning, it feels like there's so much distance, right, between Stephen and the book of Acts and the powerful things that are happening in our lives, right? Like, now, I don't feel that experience, but, but this is meant for us, right? We're to have this assurance that God is for us, that God is with us, right? That God's presence and power are available for our lives. We're to have the assurance that God is indeed on his throne and that he is moving his church forward. He's building his church in this city. That's how church plants grow, because they recognize that God is moving in their midst, not because they have some cool, new, slick ideas that no one else is doing. You know, we're not here planting a church because everyone else screwed up at it and we're going to get it right. No, we're here because Jesus has called us to build his church in the midst of this city. And what I want you to see as well is this is what gets people through horrific suffering. This man is being stoned by a lynch mob, and he's forgiving them. He's committing his life to Jesus. Is that the kind of assurance of God's peace and God's presence that you have in your life? I don't, I don't know all of these storms that are raging in your personal life, but I know some of them. I know there are people struggling with cancer right now. I know there are people struggling with unemployment. I know there are people struggling with marital challenges and difficulties. And there are probably a zillion other things that I don't know about. But what I want you to see is the thing that gets God's people through is God's presence God's power at work in their lives in the sense that Stephen is feeling it here. And that's, 
so much in our heart for the church that we would be a church that, that longs to experience God's presence and God's power in our lives. Because when we know who God is, what he's doing, we're going to be fearless in sharing the gospel. No one's going to have to tell us to go be a fearless church, right? If we understand who this Jesus is, what he's doing, his power, his presence, his glory. If we get a big view of God, right, I'm not going to have to tell any of you to go share it because it's the best news in the world. And once you get it, you won't be able to do anything else. Because Jesus is alive and has filled us with his spirit, we're called to be a church that fearlessly shares the gospel in this religious culture in which we live. Let, let's pray. Father, as we... Step out of this church, Father, and as we step out of this kind of climate of worship and climate where your spirit is here, especially with us as we as we gather together and, and as we consider what it is to like to stir each other up to love and good deeds and ministry and witness and mission in the city. Um, God, would you go with us out of this place? Would you remind us, God, that, that we are your temple and that when we walk out of this place, we aren't alone, Father, that your power and your presence goes with us so that we can be fearless as we step into the crises of this week, as we step into our job situations, as we step into relational difficulties, as we step into all the challenges of life throws at us. Would we come at it, Father, like Stephen comes at it here in this passage of Scripture, God, with your courage and your power. God, would you, would you work in our hearts? to do that in Jesus' name.